Welcome to Practice Update. I'm your host, Dr. Jennifer Caudill, and with me today is Dr. Reshma Matani. Dr. Matani is an assistant professor in the Division of Hematology Oncology at the Sylvester Comprehensive Cancer Center at the University of Miami Health Center. Welcome to the program. Thank you. Okay, so let's just jump right in. Uh, recently, there was significant new data from Monarch 2 on another CDK4-6 inhibitor. Could you give us a comparative review of the top-line data on these agents for us? Sure. So I think that we've made incredible progress in understanding mm -hmm. the mechanisms that mediate endocrine resistance in ER-positive disease. Mm -hmm. And the development of CDK4-6 inhibitors should really be viewed as a breakthrough therapy for these patients. Currently, we have two CDK4-6 inhibitors approved, palbocyclib and ribocyclib, in combination with an AI in the first-line setting. Palbocyclib in combination with an AI uh, was studied in the Paloma 1 and then in the confirmatory Paloma 2 study, and that led to the approval of that combination as the first approved CDK4-6 inhibitor. More recently, the Mona Lisa 2 trial uh, was a very similarly designed trial looking at ribocyclib in combination with an AI, again, in the first-line setting. Uh, for patients that progress on prior endocrine therapy and uh, then uh, are, are uh, treated with fulvestrant in combination with uh, palbocyclib, that is an approved indication based on the Paloma 3 data. And when going back to the first-line studies, Mona Lisa 2 and Paloma 2, the designs of the studies were quite similar, and the patient characteristics were also quite similar in both studies. Mm -hmm. The only thing notable uh, would be that there was about a 10 percent increase or 10% uh, more in uh, patients with visceral disease in the Mona Lisa 2 trial, but otherwise very similar patients. In terms of efficacy, uh, both drugs were associated with about a two-year progression-free survival. Uh, in terms of toxicity, toxicity is a little bit different with these agents. We're seeing some QT prolongation, which requires EKG monitoring with ribocyclib. Increased LFTs are also seen uh, with that agent. Neutropenia appears to be a class effect for uh, all of these uh, CDK4-6 inhibitors. So when it comes to choosing between uh, palbocyclib and ribocyclib, it becomes uh, somewhat difficult in the setting of similar efficacy. And more recently, abemocyclib was evaluated as a single agent and also now in combination with fulvestrant in patients that have progressed on endocrine therapy. Uh, this particular CDK4-6 inhibitor appears to be different in terms of toxicity in that GI uh, toxicity appears to be more uh, than some of the other CDK4-6 inhibitors. And then there's also the potential for the agent to cross the blood-brain barrier, which was seen in preclinical data and now confirmed in a very small uh, analysis of a very few patients uh, at this year's ASCO meeting. You know, I think sometimes examples can be very helpful, especially when we're talking about these issues. You know, can you give us some, some sample patient scenarios to illustrate how you would use these agents in the metastatic setting? Sure. So I tend to use a CDK4-6 inhibitor plus an AI first line, and really I have not deviated from that approach unless I really have a concern regarding compliance. Mm -hmm. I think that the agents ribocyclib and palbocyclib have both demonstrated significant improvements in progression-free survival, and uh, they don't come at the, at the cost of considerable toxicity. I think there is a huge psychological impact on, on our ability to tell patients that they're doing well for approximately two years uh, on, on these agents in the first-line setting. Uh, when patients progressed on an AI plus the CDK4-6 inhibitor, I tend to go in the second-line setting with fulvestrant as a single agent, and I reserve everolimus and exemestane uh, as third-line therapy, mainly due to toxicity concerns that I've uh, experienced, which we're learning to manage better with the use of steroid uh, oral rinses, but still there is a significant amount of toxicity that I've had uh, or I've seen in, in my patients treated with that combination. All righty. Well, Dr. Matani, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. All righty. And thank you all for tuning in to Practice Update. I'm your host, Dr. Jennifer Caudill.